All right, everyone, let's learn about the enamel. So the enamel is the white part that covers the crown of our tooth and um, it's really hard, but it can fracture. I mean, how many of you guys know of someone that fell on their teeth and it broke, right? The enamel broke off. So it, can, it is subject to fracture. When you look at the enamel, uh, it's actually made up of inorganic material, water, and organic material. Now, when I say inorganic, all that means is that if you look at the elements, inorganic has no carbon. Organic has the element carbon. That's really the only difference. Don't get too bogged up about that. But if you were curious, the difference between it is, is in terms of element, there is no carbon in inorganic there is carbon in organic that's really the only difference so 96 percent of your enamel is inorganic there's no carbon um and four percent ha is organic and has water in fact organic is like less than one percent and then the rest is water so if you look at the crystals there's crystals inside the enamel and the name of that crystal is hydroxyapatite um, this, it's made up of calcium and phosphate and so most of your your the crystals in your enamel just remember that the it's called hydroxyapatite when we look at the organic component so the part that actually has carbon um, there is a protein within that organic component of enamel and that protein is it's very similar to the protein that you find in skin like keratin it's known as enamelin so enamelin is also found in enamel so again we have 96 percent so enamel is basically made up of 96 percent inorganic material which is hydroxyapatite so these are crystals that have no carbon this is um calcium in case you were wondering carbon just has c not ca um organic component there is a small small amount um less than one percent if you were curious and it's enamel and there's uh, the protein is called enamelin that makes up the enamel and then there's water so if we look at uh, the color of enamel, it's usually grayish white, as we see, but sometimes it appears yellow. And the reason why it appears yellow is because underneath is dentin, and dentin is yellowish, so that color might just, like, you know, transmit out to the enamel and make it look slightly yellow. If we look at the range, the enamel range, it is 2.5 millimeters thick. And you'll notice that it is really thick at the top okay so like where the biting surface is where the occlusal surface is and it's thinner at the um, cervical so cervical means neck so kind of where the crown where the enamel kind of comes to an end it's thin there but it's really thick at the occlusal surface or incisal surface now the enamel has a bunch of rods so all these are rods that what we're looking at their rods and you combine a whole bunch of rods and you get the enamel so it's made up of rods and there's four cells there's four ameloblasts these are cells that make enamel so four ameloblasts are used to make up one rod so let's look at this one cell one ameloblast makes up the head two ameloblasts makes the neck and one more ameloblast so the fourth one one ameloblast makes the tail so in total we have four right one makes the head two ameloblasts makes the neck one makes the tail so in total there's four ameloblasts that make the rod Now, if we look at the structure of the rod so these are all if we look microscopically these lines that we're looking at these are enamel rods and where, where they start is they start at the DEJ. So DEJ stands for, stands for dentino enamel junctions, where the dentin and enamel meet. So here's the white is your enamel. Just imagine the block to be your dentin, and that line where they meet is known as your dentino enamel junction. So this is your dentino enamel junction, and then the lines, the enamel rods, just run um, perpendicular to it. So if this is this is your dentino enamel junction right here. That's like right here and the lines, the enamel rods run perpendicular to it.
when we look at the rods so this is again this is a rod okay so here's your head here's your tail the neck is kind of in the middle um what i want you guys to know is the rods we know is perpendicular right so if this is your let's see again if this is your dentin it runs perpendicular to it so kind of away from it at the very top at the cusp what you'll notice is the rods are gnarled or intertwined and so that always happens during the uh, or where the cusp tips so that's why it's called gnarled enamel another point to note is when you look at this rod okay so when you look at a rod it is the outer part of the rod okay so the outer part of the rod is called a sheath so the covering of the rod is a sheath and then the middle, the core, is the middle of the rod. So if we're looking at the rod, the core, where the kind of where the neck is, if you will. That's um, the known as the core. The center of the rod is the core, and the core is uh, most sensitive to demineralization. And what demineralization means is the enamel gets really weak because the ions can go away. So um, sometimes when we say you have a cavity, it could be because of de it's probably because the enamel demineralized, the enamel lost the ions and it became weak. So demineralization or weakening of the enamel is more common in the core. So in the core, in the very middle the neck of the rod. I want to show you um, this white, let's see if we can see it, this white band. I don't know if you can see that white band. This is prominent when you shine light on it. Okay, so when you shine light on the enamel, you might be, if you look really closely, you could see these bands. These bands are called Hunter Swager bands. Okay, so this guy named Hunter, he found it. That's why it's called Hunter. And he found these bands, and these bands are actually known as Swager bands. Okay, so when you shine light on the enamel, you can see these bands. There's like light bands, and dark bands, and light band, and then dark band. Those are known as Hunter Swager bands. Another term to note is the striae of Retzius. And what that is, the striae of Retzius is basically, okay, if we look at this picture over here, when, we're, when we get enamel, and you may remember this <coughs> from our other videos, enamel gets deposited in increments, right? So we get the bottom layer, then we get another layer on top, and another layer on top. So it happen, there's like recurrent deposition of enamel. It happens in layers. It happens in increments. Those increments, there, it, it, there's lines, right? So the bottom layer of enamel gets formed, put, then this other layer of enamel gets put, and then another layer of enamel gets put, that rhythmic recurrent deposition of enamel. It, it forms these lines, right? And these lines, these incremental lines, these lines that, ha so one, you know, you get enamel here, and then another layer happens, and another line gets formed. That line is known as the striae retzius, that incremental line. And they're a little accentuated, they're a little raised, because um, every time enamel gets deposited, you can you can see, the, if you look really closely, you might be able to see the incremental line. That's slightly raised, and so that's known as the striae retzius. There's also this neonatal line. I kind of want to bubble that. Okay, neonatal line is another term that I want you guys to know. So enamel gets formed in the uterus, so inside the mother's womb, and it also develops outside the uterus. So when the baby's born, enamel still forms. And so what happens is when it's inside the uterus, there's enamel. Okay, so this is the enamel that was formed inside the uterus. Then the baby got born, came out of the uterus, came out of the mother's womb, and then enamel keeps developing. And when it develops after, okay, so after the baby comes out, there, there's a, you can see a, a line that's known as the neonatal line, where the inside part is the enamel that got deposited when it was inside the womb, and then these are enamels that's getting formed outside the womb. So that line over here is known as the neonatal line. Enamel lamella, or lamella, um, lamella is plural, lamella is um, singular, are basically cracks. 
in the enamel and you can actually see this so you don't need a microscope just by looking at it you you might be able to see cracks in enamel if you see cracks in enamel that's known as enamel lamella or lamellae now why could this happen it could happen because of st stress cracks or temperature changes so if you're drinking hot tea and then you're having ice cream something cold and you're interchanging that all the time the temperature can cause a crack the temperature change from hot to cold can cause a crack that's one one way it could be caused so these are cracks in the enamel now these cracks can actually start right at the top of your enamel it can go all the way down to where the dentin starts so the dentino enamel junction because of these cracks if we have them, we're more prone to caries, we're more prone to cavities, because like bacteria can seep in there and it can form cavities. So it's not always a good thing, right, to have these cracks because we're more prone to cavities. Here's another image of the lamella where you can see the crack which starts right at the very top, the incisal or occlusal edge, and it can go all the way down to the dentino enamel junction. Another word to note is enamel tuft. So enamel tufts are located at the DEJ, the dentino enamel junction. So where the dentin and enamel meet, that's your DEJ. And you can see the tufts are just coming up from here. Okay, so they come from the, the tufts. So here's your dentino enamel junction. And if you look at the dentino enamel junction, you'll see it's scalloped, right? It's not really a straight line that's separating the dentin and enamel. It's like a scalloped line. And what you'll notice is those tufts, the enamel tufts, they come from those uh, peaks, the scallop peaks. So if you look at where it peaks, that's where you see the tufts. This over here, by the way, is the crack, right? The enamel lamella. Um, another point to note is in between the spaces of the tufts, that's where enamelin, which is like a protein, if you will, um, kind of gets in there. So enamelin goes in between those tufts. Then we have enamel spindles, okay? Um, that again, it comes from it, the dentino enamel junction, and they're a lot smaller than the top. The tufts are kind of go up higher. The spindles are a little smaller. And so the, what it says here is it's extensions of dentinal tubules. So when we look at dentin, we'll understand what this word means. But dentinal tubules are kind of like long holes or tubes. And it comes, so there's tubes in the dentin, and then it comes out into the enamel. And when it comes out into the enamel, it's known as enamel spindles. And enamel spindles have a cell inside them, and that cell is known as odontoblasts. Odontoblasts are the cells that make dentin, right? So there's odontoblasts that kind of house inside or live inside the enamel spindles and because there's cells that are inside the enamel spindles sometimes when we drink something hot or cold and we feel sensitivity it's because of the odontoblast that's living inside that spindle so enamel spindles are shorter than tufts tufts are a little higher a little longer um, enamel spindles are really really tiny they're like only a few millimeters in length so it's really small Pericaimata. Pericaimata are known as imbrication lines. Can you see these like lines are here? And they are um they're ridges. You can actually kind of see they're raised, right? You can actually kind of see the raised um lines that we're looking at. And so they are just external manifestations of the striae breathless. So remember we were talking about how these incremental lines, which are known as striae breathless, when you look at the raised portion, the raised portion are known as perichemata. Okay, that's basically the raised portion. And these, as this is another picture, if you zoom in, you might be able to see it a little bit more. These raised lines are usually, I know it doesn't show this here, but they're usually more prominent around the cervical region, on the facial surface, on the outer surface. And cervical region means the neck of the tooth, so right here. This is where you would see um, the perichromata, the lines, the raised lines, would be more prominent at the bottom for the cervical region. When we look at the enamel, if you look at the outer layer of the enamel, it is actually prismless. So there isn't a lot of um, rods, enamel rods, in, in that area right there. So it's a zone of prismless enamel. And there you won't see those bands that we were looking at, you know, the light and dark bands known as the hunter switcher bands. They're not going to be found in the outer prism-free zone. Um, the, the reason why this is 
kind of important to know is because in that zone of prismless enamel, if we wanted to put a filling on top of it, it actually, knowing that there's no enamel rods there, is actually sometimes easier to put a filling there. It enhances the bond strength. So like the composite restorations, the white fillings, white fillings are known as composite restorations. They actually um, bond really nicely to in the outer prism free zone or the zone of prism less enamel. Permeability. So permeability refers to how um, it's basically saying that the enamel is permeable, which means that the fluids and you know liquids and particles can actually seep through the enamel, especially if you have cracks, which are known as enamel lamellae, or if you have um, enamel tufts, or if you have enamel spindles, it, the fluid and particles can seep in. Micro lamellae are known as really, really tiny spaces between enamel rods. So between enamel rods, there might be really tiny spaces. And those spaces are known as micro because they're really small. Micro lamellae. The last slide is on etching. And etching basically means, um, if you like, the way I remember it is like holes in your enamel. So sometimes what happens is we can have a deep groove. In our on our occlusal surface, which mean and when you have deep grooves, it means you're likely to get cavities. So what they'll do is to prevent you to to get cavities. What um what dentists or hygienists can recommend is sealant, and this is what sealant looks like. They they put a sealant on top so that you're less likely to get a cavity in that area because we filled it up so that bacteria and food and stuff can't get through and can't rot the teeth. What they do be to create the sealant to make the sealant you have to etch it first so they put this liquid this blue liquid here they let it sit for like 30 seconds and then they wash it away but what happens is when you put the etch it actually makes holes in the enamel and the reason why you want holes in the enamel is really really tiny holes and it looks really frosty when you actually do it the reason for that is because when you put the white sealant on it kind of locks into place it locks into the um, enamel nicely that way so etching which is using an acid can change the surface of the enamel it creates these uh, holes if you will and so that way it can when you put the sealant on it adheres nicely there's more surface area for it to adhere to so etching is really good uh, etching is really it's actually needed when you're doing a filling when you're doing a sealant because that's the only way it'll lock nicely into the enamel the filling material the sealant will lock nicely into the enamel all right thanks for listening